I just wanted to say hello to everyone. My name is Heather Mayfield and I am serving as the secondary counseling coordinator for Frisco ISD. So I help support the middle school and high school counselors and just work with the overall district program. And just again, good to see you tonight. Students, parents, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, this is gonna be an amazing presentation and we're just so happy the Princeton Review has helped us um, set this up tonight. So it's coming up just about five after. Um, Rob, if it's okay with you, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Heather? Let's do it, yeah. I'm all set, yeah, perfect. Good. Awesome. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Marcy Skinesny, and I'm the High School Outreach Manager for the Princeton Review in Frisco, Texas. Um, Frisco ISD has partnered with the Princeton Review for quite some time to bring you not only the test prep that we're renowned for, but also some information to help you make really important decisions that you're going to make on your journey to college and even beyond. So tonight I'm really happy to have Rob Franick joining us. Rob is the editor-in-chief of the Princeton Review and he appears regularly on NBC's Today Show as well as on ABC, CBS, Fox and PR PBS. Um, is also the publishing director of our line of, um, of titles, and he has more than 150 titles under his belt at this point, including the best 386 college editions. So Rob is truly an expert on all things college and admissions, um, and I'm thrilled to have him here with us tonight. He's just a wealth of information, and he graciously shares that um, with us anytime we ask. So um, so thank you so much, Rob. Um, we have about an hour together tonight, and I don't want to take up too much of our time. Um, so I'd like to go ahead at this point and turn it over to Rob. Um, thanks so much for being here. And Rob, I'll leave. Excellent. Marcy, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Ms. Mayfield, Ms. Cook, uh, the full team at Frisco ISD uh, for inviting us in uh, to lead this conversation uh, tonight. And I really do hope, folks, that it is a conversation. I know that it can get really boring having somebody just talk at you for, you know, for 60 minutes. Uh, so I do have some, some things planned that we can be as interactive as possible uh, for the next 60 minutes. The last slide here is going to be my full contact information as as well as Marcy, who was just speaking, please let's continue this conversation as we move forward. If there are things that you didn't understand or questions that you have further, we all know the uh, paint is literally being applied on so many of these issues that we'll be covering tonight. Uh, so we do know that they will uh, change. We have had, uh, as um, the team was saying, Ms. Mayfield specifically, we've had a long time partnership with Frisco uh, ISD. So please do reach out to us as, as resources and, and partners moving, uh, moving forward. Um, on that issue of interactivity, uh, Marcy, uh, who was just speaking, is going to be my literal eyes on the chat, the chat board that you have there. We're calling uh, Marcy my virtual Sherpa for the next 60 <laughs> minutes. Uh, so Marcy, I, can, I, I, I there's so many people here that I, I wouldn't be able to monitor the, the, the board and see all of your questions. Uh, so uh, we'll, we're going to be using both the thumbs up feature as well as the wave feature. You've, I'm sure you are all now uh, confirmed Zoom experts after the last seven months of time, but we'll be using them and I'll be prompting you to do, to do that. For the fill in the blank questions, you'll be using the chat feature. Marcy will be my eyes there. We have our other colleague, Christine, as well, who will also be monitoring that board. So we will hear you, and then uh, Marcy will volley back some of your answers, uh, some of your answers to me. Marcy, does that sound fair as a good setup? Absolutely, I think that'll work. Excellent, excellent. Then folks, I, I promised uh, Ms. Mayfield and Ms. Ms. Cook, the full team here at Frisco ISD, that I would um, focus on these two issues tonight all with the goal of this idea of finding your dream colleges. And I suspect that both of these issues are near and dear to the hearts of every college bound student, no matter your age group, as well as parents and guardians and this whole group that's awesome and, uh, and glorious and with us tonight. The first thing that I promised Ms. Mayfield that we would speak about is how do you as students actually find colleges and universities that are going to be the best fits for you? And number two, how do we as families not break the bank to pay for these schools? I suspect, folks, that these are important issues to both students and parents and the full team on this, uh, uh, this virtual call tonight. And I will make sure that in this next 60 minutes of time, folks, we hammer on both of those issues so that you feel confident and ready to take on this process. Now, with that said, I would be remiss if I didn't note 
that I promised Ms. Mayfield specifically that during the next 60 minutes of time, I would try to keep our conversation together as active and as uh, informed, but as not boring as possible. So keeping true to my promise, as I had said in my opening soliloquy here, I wanna make sure that we uh, can have some interactivity. So I'm going to start off with a series of questions. And friends, fair warning, these questions are gonna start off really easy and they're gonna get progressively difficult as the next 60 minutes moves on. I'm hoping that's fair enough. Here's my first question and it is a simple question and all you're going to use is the thumbs up feature or the wave feature on Zoom. I'm gonna see that or Marcy's gonna translate those things back to me. Here's the first question and it's an appropriate question for every college bound student their parent, extended family member, everybody in this virtual room with us tonight can answer this question simply by raising the, uh, you know, giving us a thumbs up or raising your hand. Uh -huh. Please raise your hand or give us the thumbs up if you as a student or your parent are concerned about getting into a good college or concerned about your kids getting into a good college? That's an easy softball question. It's the easiest one I'm gonna send out there. I'm actually seeing it on my screen. This is awesome. Holy gosh, it's like the stock market ticking up here. <laughs> I'm seeing it. <laughs> okay, folks, you can put your virtual hands down. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some reaction from the, from the crowd. This is awesome. Folks, hear my voice tonight. Hear Ms. Mayfield's voice and Marcy's voice, Ms. Cook's voice, your full college counseling team's voice when you go back to your own schools. Hear our voices when we say that whether you decide to move on to a great graduate school or professional school after you graduate from college, or you decide to move on to a career of substance upon graduation, hear our voices when we say that where you earn your college degree matters. And folks, I'm gonna preface that to say that I am in no way suggesting that the 247 participants that I see out there tonight should only be applying to the most competitive schools in the land. What I am saying is that we owe it to ourselves to find schools that are going to be dream schools. And the way I define dream schools is your best fit school. That can well be the most competitive school in the land, but it needn't be that most coveted school. It could be the school that is the right one for you academically, campus, culture, financially. We're gonna walk through the different channels and buckets in that, uh, in that calculus that is, so, that is so fun. But that's what I'm saying of why your school matters. Okay, that's the first question. Second question, also appropriate to every one of those 247 uh, participants on this call tonight. Please raise your hand or give us the thumbs up um, or wave your hand. If you uh, are scared, stressed, or nervous about the college process. And folks, I'm seeing them, I'm seeing, them. oh boy, those hands are coming up quicker than the other, than the other question. And folks, I, I'm seeing them tick up there. Awesome, okay. You could put your virtual hands down. Folks, we should acknowledge on today's call that no matter who we are, how well-educated, how well-intentioned, how thoughtful we may be around the college admission process, particularly now in this COVID time, how could we not be scared, stressed, and nervous? Folks, if that is you, then look around in our virtual classroom tonight because you are not the only one. You are human and you've come to the table to have a conversation of substance to diffuse some of that fear, to diffuse some of that worry and stress in the college process. And it is, I applaud you uh, for, uh, for doing that. I often ask that question of students and parents, and, and uh, as Ms. Mayfield knows, and my, my dear colleagues, Marcy and, and, and Christine, uh, I spend a lot of time out on the road during the regular academic year, pre-COVID, um, talking to college-bound students and their parents and counselors. I, I just counted up for tonight's event. I did a little over 100, uh, exactly 107 events live in high schools last, last year. And I like the idea of being able to talk to students and parents about the process. And I ask them some warm-up questions like we did before. As much as I love that, friend, what I really love to do in complement to that is to survey and to get some real data from college-bound students and their parents about the subject of college admission. 
And I have a, we have a survey, a longstanding survey. It's an annual survey at the Princeton Review, and it's called College Hopes and Worries. Those of you who have heard me speak before probably have heard me reference it because it's central to what we do. Um, but what I love about it is that um, it's a survey of college-bound students and their parents. We had a little over 13,000 of them complete, this, complete the survey this past year, came out in mid-COVID, so it's interesting data, both pre and post-COVID, or pre and during COVID. And we asked students questions. And the idea around it is that if I can understand where students' hopes are, then it's an easy putt to help you get there. But more importantly, if I can understand where you're stressed and you're worried and you're nervous around the college process, and again, who isn't, um, then we can create conversation and content and resources to help you diffuse those things. So, so interestingly enough, I asked a question on the survey, you know, what is your biggest fear? And out of the 13,000 students and parents that completed the survey this year, and this has been running now the last six years in a row, the same question has come out as the number one thing. And that number one fear, stress, and worry that students reported to us was their concern, their fear around assuming too much debt to pay for college. And a very close second was that students would get into their first choice schools, but families wouldn't be able to pay for it. And folks, I, I, I know Frisco ISD, I've presented in your schools many times. I know you are a blessed and, and wonderful community academically and otherwise. But folks, if this is you, and most people across the country are uh, nervous about college costs and nervous about uh, navigating the financial aid process and nervous, as we said, about assuming too much debt, either as a family or as a young graduate upon graduation from college. If that is you, just like our fear and stress around the process, you're not alone. But the thing is, you're coming to the table to have this conversation of substance. Um, so I have another slide here, and I should just acknowledge I'm not the best PowerPointer in the world. I will send you home and send Ms. Mayfield ho home and, and your full team home with this presentation deck. Feel free to use it. The video recording will be here, as Marcy had said. But again, stay in, don't hesitate to stay in contact with me, parents or, or, or counselors or, or even families in general, uh, with my contact information. But here's the thing. I want to put this one up. Um, the next slide is about this College Hopes and Worries survey. So we now understand that the biggest fear for students and parents is around debt. So I said, okay, we have an opportunity on our survey to ask students and parents, if you're worried about debt, what do you actually think college is going to cost? So I have the slide up here. I, I, I dislike reading uh, slides to you, so I'm just going to give you the highlights here, folks. Out of the 13,000 folks that we asked this question of students and parents, college-bound students and their parents, um, what do they think college is going to cost? I'll just give you the highlights. 43% said $100,000 or more, 24% said $75,000 to $100,000. Folks, we collect this information at the Princeton Review, the college board who creates the SAT, AP exams, they collect this information as well, and we call it total cost of attendance. Now, total cost of attendance, my friends, that's the big four. That's tuition, room and board, fees, and books. So as I said, I'm going to keep this as interactive as this platform will allow us. I want you students and parents to slug in to the chat feature. Again, M Marcy is my eyes on this because I can't see it. I want you to slug in what you think the total cost of attendance is for one year of public college or university. Now, again, this is public schools, college, and so it's tuition. That's in-state tuition. Room and board, fees, and books. What's the number for one year total cost of attendance? Marcy, I'm seeing numbers come up here, but I can't see what they're saying. Give me some, give me some information. We have a really wide range here, Rob. We have okay. guesses everywhere from um, 15,000 to yep. um, 30, lots of, um, lots of families coming in at 30, um, 75,000. 75,000. 75,000, um, someone, um, someone estimated 100,000 plus. 100,000 plus, um, okay. We've got 120, we've got 60, we've got lots of different expectations in terms of cost okay. for, for a year. I hear you, I hear you. Marcy, thank you so much. Okay, folks, so I have some good news for some of you. When we think about total cost of attendance, again, public, public college, your public state, state university, city college, whatever, um, the number this year, 21,000. $370. But again, folks, it is, it is not unreasonable to shout out those larger numbers because that is what we hear no matter where we get our news from. We're hearing costs of college escalating. And while that is true, we need to arm ourselves with good 
and clear information that is correct. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, make sure that we talk about that again, but let's move to the second one. Total cost of attendance, and this is the sometimes heart-stoppingly expensive one, Marcy, I'm gonna preface this and just say that, but total cost of attendance, tuition, room and board fees and books for one year of private college. Stick it into the text box, folks. Let me see the numbers start to crop up here, Marcy. I'll give you a couple of seconds and you read me what they're saying. We've got 50, we've got 60, we've got 80,000, we've got 150,000. Um, we have a USC student there with the 80,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, 65, 70, um, lots in the 50 to 60 range. Okay, okay. Um, 35 to 45, 85,000 yeah. lots awesome. of estimates. Okay, this is good, this is good. Thanks, thanks, Marcy. Okay, <laughs> folks, again, good news for, for some of you, but again, not unreasonable that we should loft, we should loft really high numbers, but here's the good news, $48,510. And I'm just gonna acknowledge that's nearly $50,000 and I just said that's good news to pay for it for one year of college. I'm gonna recognize that that's a little cartoonish out there, but again, um, we need to understand the numbers. Those of you that are answering those larger numbers, you're, you know, I joke around with the USC thing, but USC this year is going to be seven, seven, pardon me, seventy-seven thousand dollars, right? University of Chicago over eighty thousand dollars this year, right? And and so there are schools that are in our universe, likely in your universe. You may be applying to them, you might just know their names that are charging those loftier sums. But there is some solace, friends to understand these numbers. I've been teaching for a long time as Marcy has and, and, and our entire team at Princeton Review. I, I love the idea of equipping students and parents with very clear and clear information so that they don't feel hoodwinked by, by some of the information that they're seeing out there and that there is some confidence that can build. Okay, as I said before, college hopes and worries survey, number one fear is the level of debt. What is the actual level of debt? So here it is. Average student debt, the debt load that students, and this is between public and private schools, for just the graduating class in, in spring of 2019, those students that just got out of school, folks, I want, you to, I want you to slug into that chat function what you think the average student in 2019 graduated with by level of debt, the number one fear that students and parents have. Slug it in there, and Marcy, you'll tell me when some things start to come in. Someone said more than enough, which I think is a great answer. Um, more than <laughs> more than enough. Um, we've got a hundred thousand. We've got fifty thousand. Yeah. Um, we've got seventy thousand, sixty thousand. Uh, we're kind of all over the board, kind of in the all higher the end of the numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And that's and that's okay. And 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 honestly, again, not unreasonable that you should loft over those numbers. But the real numbers this year, twenty nine thousand four hundred dollars. Now again. This is between public and private schools, but we have to understand that, again, no matter where we get our news sources from, we are continuously, uh, uh, you know, hearing about students. And these, this might be true. I, mean, I suspect it is true. Students that um, have ballooning debt, 50, 80, $100,000. The really crushing part, and Marcy and Ms. Mayfield, you know this well, um, the really crushing part are those students that have ballooning debt and no undergraduate degree, no college degree to show for. That's the soul crushing part. But we should also understand that again, we need to equip ourselves with this number. Okay, I'm beating this point down. Let's, let's look at this one. The amount of education debt that exists. And before you slug in that number, I'm gonna ask you to do it in two seconds. I'm just gonna give you this uh, prompt. This is a cartoonishly, ridiculously large number. That's my hint. Slug it in there, what do you think? Oh, 25 billion, 3 trillion, 2 billion, 600 billion, um, 4 billion, 1 trillion, in the billions. In the billions, okay, okay. Here it is, folks. Here's the number. $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. So, if you're reading your newspaper or online or you're listening to the news or whatever and you're and the people use it and now going forward if you don't hear this number you're going to hear it all the time going forward but here's the thing that 1.5 trillion it's true that it is the total amount of outstanding student debt but it is not just inclusive of four-year colleges it includes not only four-year colleges not for profit four-year colleges but it includes law schools business schools, medical schools, grad arts and sciences, and for-profit online institutions. 
if we just remove the graduate and the art, uh, the graduate and the uh, professional school, law school, B school, med school, grad arts and sciences, that number would come down by 40%. So again, my job, Ms. Mayfield's job, Ms. Cook's job, Marcy's job. Our job is to interpret these numbers to serve you up what you need to know so that you're not bombarded by information that causes fear and worry, and then you can't take the next steps. Or if you're in my classroom, I feel like students that are motivated by fear, nervous to take the SAT or nervous to take the ACT, my job is to diffuse the fear because those students will feel confident. Same thing with this, right? It's easy to get nervous around money, even if we're blessed financially, but the truth is that we just need to arm ourselves with the right information. I'm beating this point down, but it's a good one. It's a good one to make. Um, when thinking about this process and, uh, um, and just the, the, the part of the process of, about it, again, I go back to that college hopes and worries survey. Um, in thinking about what the, the last question that I asked in the survey this year is what is the one piece of advice that folks going through the college process last year would give to folks in your seats tonight? And I just took some vignettes, but, but the, the, the biggest piece of advice that college-bound students and their parents in 2019 for the fall entering class of 2020, just think about these students and how pummeled they were due to COVID and, and having to try to matriculate into college. So these are pretty sage advice. But the first piece of advice, and this is overwhelmingly the biggest, was this. Start the college process as early as possible. And when it says start the college process, start the research part of the college process as early as possible. Folks, it's the 14th of September. This is the one of the earliest talks that I've given to college-bound students and your parents. Don't give yourselves a virtual pack. Pat yourselves on the back. You guys are doing the right thing. This is not the end of November and we're having this conversation. It's the beginning of the academic year. You deserve some applause for it because you are coming to the table to have a conversation of substance to start tonight and then continue throughout the fall. And I know we have some younger students in the, in the, in the, in the audience, so throughout the process over the next couple of, couple of years. Now, Marcy knows this well. I did a talk last week. I, I live in New York City and, and I, uh, I gave a talk last week in, in New Jersey. Great school district, very similar to, to Frisco ISD. You know, wonderful schools, engaged counselors, engaged parents, you know, this great community. So, I give this talk and I said, okay, uh, I'm gonna tell you two pieces of, uh, two facts around college admission that I'm convinced you're never gonna hear anywhere else. And the first fact was this, it's never been easier to get into college than it is today. And the second fact that we threw at that crowd was this, it's never been harder to get into college than it is today. And they're like, who is this quack? How could it both be ridiculously easy and amazingly difficult to, to, to go to college? And I said, okay, we're gonna to try to prove out my completely unscientific theory, but we are going to do it together. And it was a big room, 300 plus, I mean, a virtual room, obviously. 300 plus people were participating just like tonight. And uh, I said, okay, here's the assignment. And folks, here's the assignment that I'm gonna give you the same assignment. We're gonna see how you compare with the students in, in Northern New Jersey from the, other, from the other day. Here's the assignment. For every student listening to my voice, you can use the chat feature because I can't see it, you can use your phone. Here's my Twitter account, at the Princeton Rev. You can tweet it to me, or you could just simply type it in. You could write it on a piece of paper. I don't care. It's not to be graded. But here's the thing that I want every student to write in, type down, type into the chat, whatever. I'm beating this down. I want you to write down or type in the names of three colleges or universities that you would love to see yourself at as a college freshman with these two caveats. Folks, I don't care if you don't have a prayer in heaven to get into those schools academically or $2 in the bank rubbed together to pay for it. So it doesn't matter about academic admission and it doesn't matter about financial aid. That's the three schools. I want you to start writing them down. Parents, or I want you to channel your son or daughter who you're sitting next to, or I want you to, to, I want you to, I want you to do the same exercise. I want you to write down three schools that you would love to see them at as a college freshman. Same caveat, doesn't matter about academic admission and doesn't matter about money. Folks, I'm giving you a whopping, I'm gonna put this on my phone, a whopping 27 seconds to write down these schools. Ready, go, 27 seconds. Any school is fair game, public or private, large or small, use the chat feature, use your phones. My Princeton, the, at the Princeton Rev is my Twitter handle. Write them down. Um, any school is fair game, as I said. They could be public or private. They could be large or small. They could be uh, urban, suburban, or rural. 
Folks, you have 13 seconds. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. These could be military academies. They could be, uh, oh, they could be for profit schools. They could be online schools. They could be, um, I said military academy. Oh, they could be international schools. They could be international schools totally. Uh, okay. Here we go. Three, two, one. Okay. I want you to keep either your pens in your hands or your fingers on your phones or your keyboard. And I want you to, parents and students, I want you to cross off the following schools. I want you to cross off every Ivy League school. We know what they are. We did this last week and you could literally almost hear the virtual groans in the classroom when I forced them to cross off every Ivy League school. I suspect that I'm hearing some audible groans out there from you guys as well. Every Ivy League school goes. I want you to cross off, and Marcy, you can help me out with this from Ms. Mayfield if I miss one in Texas, but I want you to cross off UT. I want you to cross off a and as much as I love these schools, but cross them off. I want you to cross off Southwestern. Is that a good one, uh, Marcy, for this exercise? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One of my, uh, love it, love it, love it. I want you to cross off Baylor. University of Houston, as much as I deeply love, I love that school too, University of Houston. Get rid of it though. I want you to get rid of it. Any other Texas schools, Marcy, before we move on from, to another state? Um, I would say- Oh, TCU, TCU. TCU, um, Rice would be on that list. Oh my word, how could I forget it? Rice and TCU, get rid of them. All right, let's move on. We've picked on Texas enough. We're gonna cross off a couple of other uh, schools uh, nearby. We're gonna cross off uh, University of Alabama. Let's cross off a um, couple of California schools. Let's cross off UCLA, the most popular school in the land, 114,000 applications last year. Get rid of it. I want you to cross off UC Berkeley, USC, University of Southern California. We're gonna move to my home city. We're gonna cross off NYU. We're gonna leave New York. We're gonna cross off a couple of schools in the Northeast, Boston University, MIT and Boston College. We're gonna cross off three schools in DC. We're gonna cross off Georgetown, George Washington and American. We're moving to the Southeast and then we're done. We're gonna cross off Clemson. I love Clemson. Dump it, get real for, for this exercise. I want you to cross off UNC Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Georgia Tech, Marcy, another school, maybe another, maybe a Florida school. Um, FSU. FSU, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, Florida State. All right, that's about thirty, Marcy. Yeah. I think so. Okay, folks, pens down, hands off your screens, hands off your phones. I'd like to see a showing of hands, virtually. Who still has three schools on their list? Now I named no more no more than 30 schools and there's 3,000 four-year colleges out there all right i see four coming up on my screen so four people out of nearly 300 and i know we have parents and students using the same account okay i'm going to call that seven people seven people we named about 30 schools and seven people still have three schools on their list how about this two schools on your list how many people still have two schools on the list after i forced you to cross off those 30. calling that 14. One school on your list, folks. One school remaining. All right, I'm calling that 19. Folks, we're nearly 300 people in this room. We have a problem here. And the problem is this. The problem is that it has never been easier to get into college than it is today, and it has never been harder. And we have proven it out in our relatively small room tonight. Folks, it has never been easier to get into college than it is today. Because as I said, there are over 3,000 four-year colleges in the US alone. But it's never been harder to get into college because we are all applying to the same 30 schools. We are gonna let this tr trickle down into our noggins. And, and, and I, I should say, these schools that I force you to cross off, I am a huge fan of each of them. But we need to understand that not every one of those schools is gonna be a perfect fit for everybody in this room. Okay, I beat this point down. Here's the thing. We did this tonight with you know, nearly 300 people. We said, listen, we have an opportunity to do this with our College Hopes and Worries survey as I've been referencing all evening. So I asked the same question, college-bound students, 
and their parents last year, well, for this year, it just came out this year, but over the last academic year. So we asked the same thing. Dream college, what would it be, barring academic admission and barring uh, cost? So here's the answers. I'm gonna first put up the students. Students said, Stanford, Harvard, and NYU, and parents said, Stanford, MIT, and Princeton. What a thoughtfully conceived list. Folks, here's the thing. I'm a huge fan of Stanford, the Ivy of the West. 47,000 students applied to Stanford last year, 4.3% of whom were accepted. Every one of those people that were accepted are superlative indeed, and I, I am a huge Stanford fan as well. But I will tell you with absolute mathematical certainty that, that, that out of that cohort of 47,000 people of, that applied, not every one of those 47,000 students are a perfect fit for Stanford. And arguably, many of the other schools that made it on top of this list. Folks, here's the thing. We need to recognize tonight, and we can say it out loud. I'm gonna say it out loud for you. You can shout it out from your seats at home. Brand and perception play in to our, to the way we think about college admissions. How could it not, right? We're not robots. We understand that we believe that, you know, glorious schools are going to provide us a best life and a best career. And the truth is that every school can promise that, but no schools, no matter how competitive they are, can guarantee it. So our job tonight and your job moving forward, and, and again, I, as I beat down from the beginning, we're there with you throughout the process. Ms. Mayfield, Ms. Cook, your full team. Um, we want to make sure that you're thinking broadly. If I came back to you next year you know, and six months from now and you still had Stanford on your list and you did all the things that we're going to talk about that we're talking about tonight and you're like, I've done my due diligence. I found fit in this school. Then awesome. Awesome. Stanford is going to be an awesome school for you, you know, to apply to it and, 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 and hopefully, you know, pr uh, succeed. But the thing is, we need to think broadly. We need to expand our mind and the margins because those 3,000 schools should be many more than just the six that are the, the, the six choices that we have up here. Okay, I beat that point down, but it's a good one. It's a good one to make. Folks, to understand admission and to understand how to get into our dream colleges, and I know your full counseling teams back at, back at your home schools talk about these things all the time, but I'm just going to volley this out there for you in the next set of questions. What are the most important things? to admission counselors and admission committees at these schools up on the screen right now and the other 3,000 that I keep referring to. Before you answer this question, I have one slide that is a comic relief slide that I think you're going to enjoy. Now I'm gonna put this slide up there and some brave souls are gonna raise their virtual hands and they're gonna click into the chat feature and they're gonna tell me the answer to this question. I'm gonna put up a date and a date line. And you're gonna tell me why this date and date line, somebody's gonna slug it into the chat feature, March is, March is gonna read it for me. Um, you're gonna tell me why this date and date line is crucial to our discussion around college admission and dream colleges. Here's the date and date line. Cambridge, Massachusetts, September 1636. Folks, why? Is this date and date line, Cambridge, Massachusetts, September 6, 1636. Why is this a crucial thing for us to understand in our conversation tonight in 2020 around admission? Marcy, if any brave souls are slugging it in there, you just tell me. Got some guesses. We've got um, Ivy League was established, first college in the United States, um, yep. Harvard was founded, um, several first colleges. Well done. That's William all right around it. You're all right. You're all right. Oh, I missed that last one, Marcy. Sorry. William and Mary. William and Mary. Oh, interesting one. Interesting one. Yeah. Here's the thing. And somebody got it, got it right. September 1636 is the first year that Harvard, Harvard opened essentially in September 1630. But I like to say it as it welcomed in its first freshman class in September of 1636. We're going to look back just a few months before to the fall of 1635. What was the admission team at Harvard looking for in that first and glorious freshman class, September 1636? What were the criteria? What was the criteria? What were the criteria, pardon me, for Harvard in that very first class? Shout it out, slug it in, 
Let me see it in the chat. Well, let Marcy see it in the chat feature. Marcy, you're just going to, what was that? What was the admission team at Harvard in the fall of 1635 looking for that class in September 1636? Um, we have some great guesses. We have, um, we have Rich. We have, um, we have the, the, the stereotypes, someone said. Um, stereotypes, Rich, okay. Like wigs, I enjoy, I like that one. Um, okay. Wigs, of, right? I like lots that. Lots of people guessing money, um, citizenship religion um yeah you're hitting the big ones yeah someone said high school diploma someone guessed um gpa sa sat and money i love it oh <laughs> wow okay <laughs> <laughs> those are folks those are all great guesses i love them i'm going to make sure i record the chat so i can i could use it in my next lecture to hear you to, to prime the pump with my things here are the four criteria that harvard admission reports out as that first freshman class you had to have character and specifically strength of character. We're going to come back to this point when we think about this in a modern context. But folks, let's just say how powerful that is to have character, strength of character, grit, perseverance, the things that you've weathered as a young student. You've all weathered successfully your time with COVID over the last seven months of time. Who else, what other students have, have, have applied to college in a time of COVID? Nobody, you guys are the first ones. Pat yourselves on the back again. You're weathering this storm. You're showing up at the table and you're having a conversation of substance. Okay, obviously I'm a fan. Okay, here's the second background. Now folks, I suspect lots of things fit into background. Uh, wealth, religion, uh, could be race, could be ethnicity, could be a lot of things that fit into that background, but that's what Harvard reports. Third on the list. Proficiency in Latin, fourth on the list, proficiency in Greek, love Harvard College admissions. Folks, we need to understand that whether we were applying to college 300 plus years ago to that freshman class in, 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 in Harvard, or we are applying to college for fall 2021 admission, 22, 23 admission. I know we have a younger group. Some of these folks are younger here, but folks, whether we were applying 300 years a year, 300 plus years ago or next year, folks, we need to understand that the college admission process is a really judgy process and it fills so many students and their parents with fears. I could easily imagine that my mom would pull me alongside and say, listen, Robert, you're never going to get into Harvard unless you complete your Greek homework. Maybe it is a, you grew up, you're, maybe you're growing up in a like household. But the truth is, folks, that we need to understand that although the process can be stressful on the surface, the process around college admission, while it has its quantitative metrics, is also a human process. The human process, just like we heard about Harvard 300 plus years ago, strength of character being the first criteria that they were looking for. So here's the question that I, I, I talked about that I was gonna pose to you, and here it is. Folks, what is, in a modern context, for fall of 2021 admission and beyond, what is the number one most important piece of information that you as a student will submit on your college application? Folks, you can use the chat feature, but before you do, I'm gonna preface it and say this. this. This answer that I'm looking for does not waver. This is completely universal for schools large and small, public and private, urban, suburban, and rural, the 3,000 schools that I keep referring to, the number one most important piece of information that you'll submit in your college application, slug it into the chat feature. Marcy, you'll be my eyes, my friend, and uh, once some things start to come in, let's hear them. The number one most important thing that does not waver. Rob, we have lots of people who are answering essay. Um, yeah. We have a couple saying SAT or high school GPA. Um, references. Um, okay. Overwhelmingly, um, the answer seems to be essay. Essay, um, okay. Couple extracurriculars. Okay. Uh, persistence, innovation, love those. Love um, that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well rounded student, self identity okay. and confidence and character. A couple of really great answers here. Okay, yeah, those are all great answers. Absolutely. And, and, just to put this, and as I, I applaud you for those answers. But going forward from tonight's virtual classroom, we're always going to answer this question confidently and correctly. The number one 
criteria that admission teams, admission committees, the admission counselors are going to be looking for in the next year or years is going to be your high school GPA. And folks, particularly from your glorious schools and in Frisco ISD, but I'm gonna I'm going to preface this and say this. Um, your high school GPA is part of it, but your high school transcript is the is the bigger answer. Folks, exiting tonight's virtual classroom, you could never underestimate the power and the heft of your high school transcript. You can never underestimate it going forward. And here's why. Your high school transcript is the most revealing document of your young lives because of this, your young academic lives because of this. It answers this question. Did you challenge yourself in high school? Did you challenge yourself with regular level courses or advanced level courses or AP level courses or IB level courses? What were the opportunities that you had in your schools in Frisco ISD? Did you take advantage of those opportunities? And then obviously, what is your GPA? What is the end result? Folks, your high school transcript is the primary driver because of its weight and heft in answering that question. And that is a powerful thing indeed. Um, even in this COVID time, right? We're calling these transcripts now that are coming out COVID transcripts, right? Because you guys know loss during an academic year and that many of your classes obviously most of your classes, if not all of your classes, move from face-to-face -to, -face to online. But the biting part is that many of your classes moved from letter grade or number grade generating to pass fail, right? But even in these COVID times, admission deans across the country are saying this is still the most important thing. Okay, beat this point down. Folks, the second most important things, we've covered the first in depth, the second most important things, to get into your dream schools, to get into your best fit schools, uh, before you answer this one using the same chat feature uh, that Marcy will, will interpret for me, I need you to know this. The second criteria, the second thing is not universal. This does change, um, but it is still the second biggest gatekeeper to college admission slugging in. What's the second biggest thing that admission teams will want to see on your high school transcript? Um, leadership, SAT, extracurriculars, okay, okay. Um, class rank, um, SAT or SA, okay. volunteer work, yep. Yep. Um, involvement in community. Yep, excellent. Um, Those AP are all classes, good. Uh, clubs and volunteering. Yeah. All good stuff, all good stuff. Folks, I wish this was not the answer. I wish it was not the answer, but it is the second biggest gatekeeper that admission teams will want to see, even in these COVID times. And we're gonna talk about the question that the young person had, uh, had volleyed over to Marcy when we first started off. The SAT and the ACT standardized tests are still the second biggest gatekeeper. Now, the SAT and the ACT being the grail, but a very close second AP exams, even SAT subject tests, even that's a bit of an outlier, but those big three, the SAT, the ACT, and of course AP exams are still the biggest gatekeepers. And the SAT and ACT combined with your GPA qualify students for not only academic admission at many schools, but also scholarship dollars at many schools. As much as the SAT and ACT, and I talk about, I've been teaching for the SAT and ACT forever. I taught my first course on how to take the SAT at the tail end of Ronald Reagan's administration. It's been a long time, but the truth is they still were gatekeepers back then. SAT and ACT, and they're still gatekeepers now, not only for academic admission, but for scholarship dollars based on your academic merit in high school and your performance on the SAT and ACT. That's just a fact. Even in these COVID times, when so many schools have moved test optional, because you guys know this just as well as I do, you couldn't take the SAT or the ACT. The first time that you could take the, AC, the SAT since 2019 was two weeks ago, right? All of your tests have been canceled. So, so, but even in this time, so many schools have moved test optional, which does not mean test prohibited, which means that you don't have to take the SAT or ACT, but you could still take the SAT and ACT. And here's the biting thing. So many schools are saying, you don't have to take it unless you wanna qualify for academic placement. 
or you want to qualify for scholarship dollars. So feel just how disingenuous that is. Again, my job, Ms. Mayfield's job, Marcy's job. Our job, folks, is to remove the blinders on, interpret these things for what they are, and to serve you up that information so that when you meet somebody at a virtual college fair or you know, have a conversation with an, an admission director, your first question is going to be, if your SAT optional or your ACT optional and I submit it, do I qualify for scholarship dollars? It's an easy question, one that you should ask. Okay, I'm beating this point down. Marcy, my next slide is, 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 is this. This is just a quick laundry list. The first two we beat down, but folks, as we talked about a few short minutes ago, even with the Harvard example, there are quantitative metrics in the Harvard example, right? We saw proficiency in Latin, proficiency in Greek. There were no SATs, no GPA from your high school, but, but proficiency, right? We understand that there are two criteria, there are two still things on that laundry list that are quantitative based on numbers, the first two, but everything else is about you. Everything else is human. There are quantitative metrics in college admission without question, but I know I wouldn't be here. I know Ms. Mayfield wouldn't be here if we didn't believe that the college admission process, whilst it has qualitative metrics, is a human process. And the other things, your personal statement, your essay, as Marcy was saying, there are lots of people that volley those things early on. Well done. These are of value. They're not number one and two, but they're a close third or fourth to that. And the thing is, you know, Marcy, we've known each other for a long time. You know, your college essay, Marcy, uh, and my college essay could never be the same because we're different people, right? We'd never want to have a, a, a we'd never want there to be a uniform way to write a college essay. You know, your college essay, folks, should be as unique as you are. And, and that, that's the power in, in, in admission. To your dream school, to the schools that make it onto your list, that's it. I, you know, folks, uh, similarly with the extracurricular activities, there is no canon here. There is no laundry list of the perfect student will have this many activities and they will all be in this area. Just like your college essay, your list of activities should be as unique as you are. Maybe you chose to do things tethered to your school, sports, music, theater, mock trial, whatever. Maybe you decided to do none of those things and you volunteer at a religious organization, your church, or your Habitat for Humanity, social stuff that you do outside you know, to, so to support social causes. Maybe you do none of those things and you work during the academic year and you work during the summertime. Folks, all of those things count to your extracurricular activities and they are of value in that way. The last one that I slugged in here, interviews. Now, not every school interviews, but a whole lot of them do. And I suspect that they're going to do it much more in these COVID times because it's easier to interview online and schools are going to be hurting for students as we move forward. Folks, if you have just a couple of quick points here, if you have an opportunity over the next months or years, depending on your age group, to interview with some representative from that admission office, it could be an alumni representative, it could be a full-fledged admission counselor, it doesn't matter who it is, whoever that anointed person is at that school. And you can sit down with that person virtually as it will likely be. And you can say to that person, I've done my research. I think that I found fit in myself, in your school, based on all of the things that I've learned and done. Folks, that's a powerful, powerful conversation, one for a young person to have. And I could not underscore this enough. I'm an old admission counselor. I, I would have been overwhelmed by a young person that could come to the table with that. And I know you can do it. I know you have weathered many difficult things, particularly over the last uh, seven, eight months of time in regards to COVID and factoring in all of those things, and you've done well. You can do just as well with college admission. These are the criteria. Um, I, I, yeah, anyway, I'm getting off my soapbox here, but you, you, you know that I am your fan. You, you know that you can do this. And I feel like these are the criteria around admission. Marcy, I might completely blown past my time, my friend. You're actually okay, Rob. You have about seven or so minutes left. Okay, okay, excellent. And folks, I, I, then I will just, I wanna make sure I'm respectful of your, of your time. We'll move quickly through the next couple of slides here. Um, folks, in thinking about colleges, now those of you who have heard me speak before, uh, and if you haven't, it doesn't matter, but um, here's the thing. I visit 
Me, I visit more college campuses than any other person on the planet. I am convinced that is a mathematical certainty. But here's the thing. When I visit college campuses, I am listening to the same presentations that you guys are listening to when you get back onto campus, when COVID finally crests, or you're going to virtual open house events, which I love and I applaud you, you should totally do it. Um, whatever it is, the, the, the pitch is going to be the same. And I, I thought it was funny enough, on that, on that question, on the college hopes and where you serve, this, this question came up, what matters most? When you're choosing a school, what will be the biggest determining factor for you as a student and for your parents, your guardians, right? What, what is going to be the biggest factor in deciding? And let's just look, I'm not gonna read the graph to you, but let's just look. Teeny tiny bit, 9% out of those 13,000 folks had academic reputation. We did that dream college exercise just a couple minutes ago, right? And we know that academic reputation, brand perception, it weighed pretty heavily in that. But what I love is that what this slide says, what this percentage says, is that, hey, you know, I'm, I can fall into the, to the trap, who, we're all human, of brand and perception, reputation, but what really matters most is finding a school that's the best fit, finding a school that is gonna be appropriate for my career interests. And that, my friends, that is glorious because you are thinking about this process critically. And you're thinking that, you know what, this is a college is of value to me, but it's a value to me to make sure I'm finding the right place. And none of this says just the coveted few schools that are acad have, have the loftiest of academic reputations. It says, I wanna find a school that's fit for me. And if that's you, and I suspect you are feeling that way, you have every right to, and you should feel that way. And again, pat yourselves on the back for that because that should build confidence around this dream college and best fit process. Um, oh my gosh, I write this book and I have been for a long time. I'm not a product pitcher, so I just put this up there for comic relief. Um, I'm not gonna put, uh, we have very little time. Why do hate, why do schools hate me, Rob Frannick, so much? Here's the thing, folks. I write this book, I wrote the team of glorious writers. It's an annual book. You can purchase it in stores or online. The thing is, I put it all online for free on our website, princetonreview.com. But many of the schools that we talk about in this book are all, and we've talked about at this lecture, are all in this, all in this book. Here's the thing. What makes this book different is that I go directly to whom I consider, Marcy considers, our full team considers college experts of their own experiences. I think I know a lot about schools, folks. Doesn't matter, oh, wait, what I think about schools. I want to go to, to students who are experiencing school right now. Now virtually, we're gonna be in a heck of a lot of surveying now, but that's the difference. What is the, um, what are students saying about their experiences academically and otherwise? I'm also gonna tell you that I, do, I am unapologetic about putting ranking lists in this book um, from best financial aid, best career services, best campus food. I am the guy, although my mom denies it to this day, I'm the guy that writes the party school list each year. Also in this book, University of Alabama, this year number one party school based on student, student experiences and, and student opinion. But here's the thing. There are 62, as you can see here on the slide, different top 20 ranking lists in this book. If you are the typical student and parent, just like we talked about before, in thinking about nervous around financial aid and, and debt, let's look at this. Best financial aid, Vanderbilt. I put this in our slides. Vanderbilt is nearly $77,000 a year, but its average gift aid, grant aid that you don't have to pay back is about $52,000 bringing their cost to right around shy of $20,000, which you guys now know is below the average of what you could expect to pay for one year of public college or university across the country. Anyway, I'm just highlighting these things here. You can dig into them. You can dig into them for absolutely free. Uh, and, and I'll make sure that I follow up, give you a follow-up note tomorrow or the next day, and I'll give you some links to this stuff. But the thing I need you to remember, folks, is that listening to students and their experiences academically and otherwise is gonna be one of the most revealing things and one of the needed components in finding a school that's gonna be the best fit for you. <clears throat> last, last thing, and I think I'll probably end here, Marcy, um, is this. La one of the last questions on the College Hopes and Worries survey is this. Is college worth it? Is college worth it? 99% of the students and parents that, you know, oh, I put 10,000 here, that's not, that's not correct. But the, the, I just updated the numbers. Out of that cohort, those thousands and thousands of students and parents, 99% said, yes, 
college is worth it, but let's look at why. 42% because you have a better job and a higher income. Folks, let's just look at these things. If a student has a college degree compared to a student that does not have a college degree, that student over their career lifetime will make on average a million dollars more. They will likely be more nimble in their professions. They can move around to different jobs more nimbly than students that don't have an undergraduate degree. Students that have a college degree, have an undergraduate degree, will report far lower rates of unemployment than students that don't have an, have a, have an undergraduate degree. Robert Wood Johnson did a, did a study a couple years back that said students that have a college degree compared to students that don't will live longer because they'll likely have better insurance throughout their lifetime. Folks, any way you cut this, any way you look at this process on average nationally, that college is worth it. It is worth it for these, for these reasons. If this is you, then you are asking the right question. If this is you and you're saying, yes, I know college can be a sacrifice, as we all know, but it is worth the investment. You're asking yourself, likely, what is going to be the return of my investment? The return of my academic investment if I'm a student and the return of my financial investment as a student and a family member. And folks, that is a, a powerful compact to have. And if you are asking that question, you have every right to do so. Folks, as I said, I listen to the same presentations that you do on, on um, college visits that I've gone on from now many, many years and, and meeting with college presidents and deans of admission. But folks, if I don't hear in the first seven minutes of a conversation talking about career services, internships, co-op experiences, uh, experiential learning. They, the, nomen, the, pardon me, the nomenclature changes from school to school, but what are students doing outside the classroom that complements the study that they're doing inside the classroom, and is that a value to that student upon graduation? And the answer, I suspect, is yes, but the truth is that some schools do it better than others, and you have every right to be asking yourself that question. Um, folks, I, I, I didn't get to all of these things. Test optional, as we talked about before, I did note this. Uh, in, a, in a year when so many things have been taken away from you, uh, as, as we talked about, moving from uh, in-person classes to online, moving from letter grades or number grades to pass-fail, your activities, athletics, music, theater, whatever they may be, cancel, cancel, cancel. Your part-time jobs likely cancel. I cannot see this in any other way. The SAT and the ACT and AP exams give you the opportunity to distinguish yourself in a time when every, so many other things have been taken away from you. Now that's really difficult to do when you think about the SAT and the ACT and all the test dates that have been canceled. As I talked about before, the first time you could take an SAT in 2020 was two weeks ago. The last time it was administered was 2019. Um, ACT fares a little bit better, but we understand that the college board who creates the SAT and every AP exams, mind you, and the ACT incorporator who makes the ACT, they're dealing with lots of issues, capacity issues, socially distant issues. We understand this. I want to make sure that we continue this conversation because it is likely that students that are here with us tonight for the fall of 2021 admission, if you're a high school senior and with us tonight, um, it's likely that you're not going to have as many SAT and ACT scores to show or maybe to the intention that you had had before, right? You might have said, oh, I'm going to take the SAT three times or the ACT twice. Um, that might not happen for you this year. But here's the solace, friends. Admission deans from across the country, from across the globe, have been saying, listen, you will not be penalized. You cannot be penalized if you don't have that test score or if you don't have as many administrations as you want. So again, I can continue that part of the conversation with you. Last thing, and then I'm going to be quiet. I do a daily or almost a daily. This week, it'll be three or oh, four times this week. I, all the things that we're talking about now, I do a series, free series on YouTube on COVID-19 and its repercussion on college admission, test preparation. If you want to, and you can stay in contact with me that way, take a look. There's 80 plus videos there talking about all the things in detail that we talked about tonight. Free, just follow it, Princeton Review, YouTube, you got it. Here's my contact information and Marcy's contact information. Folks, you have been a glorious and incredibly participative, participative uh, uh, crowd. So I thank you so much. Marcy, I'm apologizing if I've gone over my time, but uh, um, I will hand the controls back to you. And that's it, my friend. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, do we have a, do you have a couple minutes for just a of couple course. of questions? Of course, oh my gosh, yeah, I just don't want, uh, yeah, 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 of course, of course. Sure. 
Um, so we have one coming in from Sophia. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, believe me when I tell you, I feel you. Um, how important are letters of recommendation? Um, what do you do if teachers aren't responding to your request for those? And um, how important is the role that they play in admissions? Oh yeah, I so love this question. And, and I apologize, I didn't make note of the letters of recommendation. Incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, I'm gonna preface this by saying, we need to follow the directions, right? If a school says, I'm requiring three letters of recommendation, don't send in 10. And um, we need to have them from at least one or two people, one or two teachers that have had you in the classroom. It's also fair game to have your counselor write a letter of recommendation for you. If you're employed during the summertime or through the academic year to, do, to, to have an employer write a letter of recommendation for you, they're powerful for the same reasons that we talk, talked about your interview, your extracurricular activities, because they form a composite view of you through another person's eyes, another person that knows you academically, another person that knows you from a character, grit, perseverance, things that we discussed. So, so they are incredibly powerful in that regard. Now, thinking about the ease of getting them from faculty members, faculty have a lot on their plate. And, I, and that's not to, to excuse that, that, that idea of maybe uh, radio silence on, on your part, but by and large, faculty know these are crucial in college admission. Um, I would, you know, appropriately follow up, gently follow up and, and, reach, and reach out to them. I, for those folks that are younger in the audience, be thinking about which faculty or which representative, which person will be uh, creating your letters now and to, and to reach out to that person early to make it easy for that person to recommend you. What I tell all of my students at the Princeton Review is to, is to go in with a, you know, once a person acknowledges, hey, I'm gonna write your letter of recommendation, to send in a resume to them, you know, some sort of a list of what you've done. If you did work in their class, but that class was two years ago, to send in a paper from, you know, something that you've done that that person can reacquaint themselves with you very quickly, and then can use those solid talking points in your in their essay on you if it's of value is that a fair answer marcy absolutely i think that's a no. great answer so lots of questions coming in around gpa um yep. what's a good gpa to get into college um can you choose whether to send your weighted or unweighted gpa uh the, here's and then, absolutely the, folks i want to give you a clear answer on what's a good gpa but the truth is it changes from school to school um, one of the things that, I, I, that I'm very proud about doing on, on our website, PrincetonReview.com, and I'm sure if you use Naviance, you can get at this information through your own tools. But the truth is that if you're applying to a school A and school B, they might have different averages for GPA. Acquaint yourselves with them. You know, you're surely thinking about tonight and exiting tonight with a, with a, you know, a workable uh, criteria for finding a school that you're going to apply to and thinking about factoring in student opinion but always have an eye to what the GPA requirement is there and then compare it with yourself. And then you'll, you'll be able to know where you have to, what your goal might be or where you are in that mix of students that are likely going to apply. And that's, and that's a powerful thing because that's recognizing yourself. It's recognizing what you've done and it's recognizing what the mean is, what the average is in that GPA for schools that you're applying to. And again, think, think about this with a wide breadth. These are averages. You know, that means students are above and below it. So, so it's, uh, uh, it's an important thing to know from that perspective. So guys, we are about 10 minutes over now. Um, we have some great questions coming in. Um, I don't want you to feel like this is your only opportunity to ask questions. Uh, my contact information is on the slide. Um, Rob's contact information is on the slide. We're both happy to hear from you. Um, my job at the Princeton Review is just to be a resource for all of you in Frisco ISD. So please, if you have questions we didn't get to you tonight, um, send them over to me, send me an email, give me a call. Um, I'm always happy to give you a personal answer anytime. So, um, and Priya, yes, I see your question. We will send the recording and the, and the slide deck over to your counselors. Um, they'll send that out um, as they get the opportunity this coming week. But um, do stay in touch, stay in touch with me, stay in touch with Rob. Um, our job is to be a resource for you and to help you make decisions as you navigate the road to college. So we're happy to do that for you anytime. I hope you guys got lots of great information tonight. Um, looking forward to keeping in touch with you. And um, thank you guys so much for coming, Rob. Thank you again for always so being so generous with your time. Really appreciate you. Pleasure, um, to, pleasure to be here.
Yeah, everyone um, have a good night. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks folks. Good night.